<laughs> Good morning. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, always, always just awesome to be the first one and, and work through those technical difficulties. But um, happy that I get to be the beginning of the In the Beginning track uh, for B-Side San Antonio 2021. Yes, we all made it through 2020. Hooray. Um, so the title, title of the talk again is How I Got Hacked and So Can You. Uh, my name is Chip Thornsburg and the little disclaimer. So uh, opinions expressed and as I go through this talk are my own and do not represent those of my employers, uh, other law enforcement agencies or other law enforcement officers. Um, so short bio, uh, I am the program coordinator for cyber defense at Northeast Lakeview College. So we're the newest uh, campus for the Alamo Community Colleges in San Antonio. Uh, and so I'm responsible for uh, putting together curriculum and, and uh, getting that program up and running. We're exciting. We just had our first batch of graduates uh, this spring, so um, excited for that. I'm also a Master Peace Officer in the state of Texas, uh, still currently a detective with Helotus, um, which is a suburb of San Antonio. Uh, I serve on the uh, Secret Service Electronic Crimes Task Force for the South Southern Region. I own a company called uh, Alamo Cybersecurity. We do network intrusion response. Um, I have lectured and taught uh, previously for River City College, Southern Careers, uh, North Texas State College. Um, Degree-wise, I have degrees in management, criminal justice, law enforcement, uh, criminology, and, and an MBA. Um, as you'll see as we go through this talk, uh, sarcasm, uh, it's a gift and I have it in abundance. Um, and just to sort of give you some perspective, so the first hack that I ever pulled off, so it sounds like I've been doing it, I guess I'm showing my age, um, was on a machine sort of like what you see um, pictured there, and it was Angelo State University. This is before it was illegal, by the way. I should make that disclaimer. Uh, and so, because they had a really awesome Star Trek game uh, that I was just dying to pay uh, on their mainframe. And, and so that, that was my uh, introduction into hacking and computer security a long time ago. So uh, during this talk, we're going to kind of go through an overview of how my own uh, social media account uh, was hacked. Uh, we're going to talk about some motivations of attackers. Uh, talk about some of the law enforcement uh, tools that we use um, and methodologies to, to conduct investigations. Uh, we'll talk some about some investigation challenges for both law enforcement and, and for corporations and for private individuals. Uh, we'll go through some of the findings, so how we what, what we gathered up at the end of that investigation, um, and then finish off with some lessons learned. Uh, hopefully, all within 45 minutes. Uh, that is our. That's, prescribed timeline, uh, and then maybe some questions. So September 9th, uh, 2020, I'm having my morning coffee, checking my email, and I see a, uh, an email from Facebook uh, at 3.25 in the morning. Um, and it says, hey, uh, there was a recent login uh, from this IP address in San Antonio, but at 3.25 in the morning, being an investigator, being a professor of cybersecurity, I was pretty sure that wasn't me. Um, but I thought, hey, this could be some kind of good looking phishing, uh, nothing to see here, scroll on, keep looking at some messages. And then I find a second one dated same date, but about four minutes later, a password change was initiated. Same IP address, designated as San Antonio, so geolocated in San Antonio. Um, and then some great advice from Facebook saying, if you didn't do this, please secure your account. And so luckily I had set up um, challenges and uh, two-factor authentication, some other things in my account. And I was able after several hours to secure my account. Looking through, didn't see anything had changed, um, but I started thinking, how could this happen to me? Right? I, I investigate cyber crime. I've been doing this a long time. I teach cybersecurity. Um, and I have pretty good habits, right? I use complex passwords. So brute forcing, mm, no, I don't think that's how they managed to do it. Um, I don't reuse passwords across sites. So it doesn't matter if, if my email or, or a previous password was uncovered or leaked in a breach. Um, that's not the issue. Um, I'm pretty good at spotting phishing emails, right? So I get them all the time. Hey, here's one from geeksquad-accounts.ga. Mm, okay, nope, not falling for your phishing email. Um, here's another, oh, here's your invoice, right? And then the invoice is a number dot zip file and some, uh, no. Uh, those are pretty obvious. I must say I was a little, um, it, it was a challenging 
one for me yesterday when the Reverend Riley uh, told me that he was going to give me $5.4 million yesterday, but I managed not to click on any links in that one as well. Um, or smishing, right? So sending text messages, same thing. Uh, now I'm not clicking on your link. So that's not how it happened. So as I dug in more and started thinking, how did this happen? Where did this come from? I trace it back to an old email. So the first time I retired, um, I was highly involved in uh, mixed martial arts and started a company called Texas Amateur Mixed Martial Arts Association. Uh, and so we did fights all over the state of Texas, uh, in Mexico, a couple of other countries, um, other states adopted our rule set. Um, but all of that was associated with a domain texasfighter.org. And my email account at the time was president at texasfighter.org. 2010-ish, 2011, um, I got out of that business and I passed that along and I passed along that domain uh, to another entity. Obviously, they didn't continue to use it and they allowed the domain to lapse. And so someone registered that domain the day before. So September the 8th, so the day before my Facebook password changes, um, someone registers this domain and they stand up a mail server for the sole purpose of having access to that email, president at texasfighter.org. So at this point, it's pretty obvious that someone specifically targeted me, specifically targeted my account. And here's how they were initiated the password change. Um, by the way, Facebook doesn't ever forget anything. We'll talk about that more as we kind of go through this. So after I've secured my account and after I figure out this is how it happened, well, now I want, what's the motivation behind this? Why me? And I think is this like revenge? It could be. Um, I've been, the last couple of years, I've concentrated on building the, the, the cyber defense program for the college. But uh, prior to that, I mean, I've, I've seized hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've, I've seized Bitcoin wallets from bad guys. So maybe one of them has a beef and says, you know what, I'm going to get back at this guy because he cost me a lot of money. I can see that. Um, in the law enforcement, we, we place a lot of emphasis on the motivations of an attacker. Uh, and so since we're extra clever in law enforcement, we, we came up with the acronym of MICE, right? Lots of, lots of mouses since it's computer oriented, not Mises. Uh, and so we say that there are four primary motivations for an attacker. The first one being money, uh, the second one ideology, right? So hacktivism, uh, compromise, either compromise that person or further compromise uh, an entity, further compromise an organization, or use it as a staging site to compromise other entities um, or ego. And so that's kind of associated with the old school uh, kind of that hacking mentality that we all kind of have as, hey, I just want to kind of see if I can do this. Um, sometimes people go a little further than they should legally. And so that will get them into trouble. So ego being probably the, the lowest risk. But still, I'm thinking, you know what, um, for me, I, I'm still thinking this is some kind of revenge, right? They didn't post anything, didn't have time to do that. Um, and that brings us to our first challenge of investigation. So, um, why even bother reporting something like this, right? So someone tried to take over my account. I secured it. I figured out how they did it. I made sure it couldn't happen again. No harm, no foul. Um, the problem is, is that law enforcement and other entities that do investigations, we need data to, to, to determine what the emerging trends are for types of attacks. Uh, and so we used to say that about 20% of crimes are actually um, reported. And in the cyber world and cyber fraud, we're, we're thinking that might be down around one of 10. So only 10% of crimes are reported. So that means for every one crime reported, there's nine others that are out there and that data is not getting put into any sort of um, uh, pool for us to see these emerging trends. Um, so for me personally, I thought, hey, this is a good, It'll be a good challenge. I teach a forensics course um, at Lakeview and we'll just use it as part of, uh, we'll, we'll use this real investigation as part of um, our curriculum in the class. We'll step through it with our, with our students. 
so we like to think that law enforcement um, that this is our current state, right? So that we're, uh, it's Penelope Garcia or Abby Schutz over there and, and everything's high tech and we've got all these computer screens around us and we have all these awesome tools. Um, and the reality is we're probably closer to these guys, right? Uh, Adam 12 and, and Dragnet, uh, if anybody's even old enough to remember those. So a lot of what we uh, do in investigations is we kind of have to start off a little bit old school and we do that with open source um, intelligence and a lot of non-tech tools before we get to use our cool spiffy um, analysis um, computer tools. So using open source intelligence, I can look at that IP address, right? That 104 IP address that was used to log in. It's geolocating back to San Antonio. So it's bypassing some of the fencing that Facebook um, has in place to prevent unauthorized password changes to an account. So good for them. Um, as a private person, that's about all you can get at is, okay, um, who owns that and, and where does that IP come from? So as law enforcement, we have a few more tools in our arsenal, if you will. And so the first one being subpoenas, uh, there's civil subpoenas, there's administrative subpoenas. Um, both of those are somewhat useful, but big companies, you, you figure they're getting a lot of requests for data and requests for information. And so they don't really respond um, enthusiastically um, to civil subpoenas or to administrative subpoenas. But a grand jury subpoena, that's kind of different, right? So grand jury, if you're familiar with that, grand jury is, is something that was established in the constitution and a grand jury's job uh, is to investigate crimes or to help investigate crimes that may or may not have been committed within their county. So in San Antonio, that would be Bear County. So the Bear County grand jury has the ability to issue subpoenas and say, we want this document from your company. Uh, that is legally binding in every state in the United States. So most companies do a good job of responding to a grand jury subpoena. Uh, there's also court orders that investigators can apply for. Um, those are pretty limited in scope. You don't run across them too much. Sometimes when seizing bank accounts, you might use court orders, but uh, for the most part, we rely on search warrants if I need actual data or to seize physically some bit of evidence. So uh, there's federal search warrants. So think FBI, DOJ. Um, they're a little bit harder to get. Um, the uh, assistant uh, district attorneys and, and the AUSAs um, they, they kind of like to write their search warrants by committee, and it might take two or three days to get a, a search warrant done through the federal system. But state district courts, any peace officer can write a search warrant, go in, stand in front of a judge who's presiding in the court and say, hey, I have a search warrant and I need to get this, this information. I need to get this evidence and I think it's hidden here or uh, it's located here. Will you grant me permission to go get it? If a state judge says, yep, I agree, that's legit, they sign off on it and away you go and, and you can get a lot more data with a search warrant as opposed to a subpoena. So we start an investigation, open up an actual criminal case. Um, I run a who is on that address. Everyone has access to this and it's Microsoft, right? So this is a Microsoft Azure account, a machine that was located in the San Antonio office, in the San Antonio data center, uh, that was used to initiate the password change that was used uh, to prompt the initial login. So I wanna find out who owns that account, right? So who owns this account um, and what IP address are they logging into this Azure account from? So they're using virtual machines. Okay, pretty common to do that, but where did where did that originate from? And so in order to see that, I need a grand jury subpoena, get one signed, send it off to both Microsoft and my registrar, if you caught that on the last slide, um, was Wild West Domains. They're a subsidiary of GoDaddy. Uh, and so also sent a subpoena off to GoDaddy to say, hey, who registered this texasfighter.org? Uh, this person is obviously up to no good. I want to try and find out who it was. It's the whole purpose of our investigation. So 
then the waiting game happens, right? So you send off your subpoena and although they're required to respond within 14 days, that typically doesn't happen on most big um, companies. But about a week later, I get a notification on my phone that, hey, um, PayPal just tried to hit your bank account for $10 and then $600 um, for Facebook advertising. And I'm kind of shocked by that. I'm like, hey, wait, I'm not running Facebook ads. I haven't run Facebook ads since 2010, back when I was in the fight game and promoting events. So this is, is this a smishing attempt that looks good, right? Is somebody, is somebody trying to compete or is it legit? And so I log into my Facebook and Facebook says, no, uh, there are no ad accounts uh, associated with you. Um, there are no payment methods associated with you and amount spent zero dollars. But I log into PayPal and PayPal says, nope, Facebook absolutely sent this request over for money. I dispute it and say, this is obviously fraudulent and pay PayPal says, nope, uh, it's a legitimate charge because you've done this before in the past 12 years ago. So a multitude of issues there thinking really 12 years later, an account suddenly becomes active. Nobody doesn't trip anyone's threshold for problems. And when I report it as fraud, you're going to argue with me and say, no, it's legitimate. Um, that's a whole different conversation there with, with the way PayPal handles. But then I start thinking, okay, PayPal is associated with my bank. Maybe I should contact my bank and make sure there's no debits going on and hooray for local banks. Um, so I call my local bank and I'm on the phone with them. They're very helpful as most banks or credit card companies are. Um, if you've ever had to deal with, with a fraudulent purchase, um, they kind of take the statement and I'm on the phone and I'm talking to them and says, no, your bank accounts are fine. No one's trying to, um, no one's trying to uh, access them. There's nothing here, but just to be safe, we'll reissue you new cards. Okay, great idea. Um, and then, the representative says, let's look at your credit card banking. So I have a business credit card that's associated with the, with the company. Let's look at that just to see what's happening. And while we're talking on the phone, the representative says, holy cow, I've never seen anything like this before. I'm watching this in real time. And so it starts off 35, 35, 35, 50, 50, 250, then 300, then 600, and then 900, 900, 900, every few seconds. Facebook advertising is trying to charge my business credit card. Um, thankfully, local bank again says, obvious is fraudulent. He was excited because he had never seen anything like that before. He was like, wow, I've never seen this happen real time. I'm like, well, I'm glad that I got to get you some excitement in your life. For me, it's more of an irritation. But still, thankfully, I'm not out any money because I've stopped it. This is investigation challenge number two. So for law enforcement, who becomes the victim? I'm not really a victim anymore. I didn't lose money. My bank didn't lose money. They didn't have to reimburse. They just blocked all of the charges. And so technically speaking, Facebook is the only victim here, right? They're the ones running advertising and they're not getting the money for it. Um, Facebook probably is not going to call back to Chip Thorns and we're going to say, hey, can you investigate this further? We want to try and figure out who did this, right? Big company. Who knows how much fraudulent advertising is run uh, on any given day for them. So it's a challenge as far as who is the victim. And then you go back into that. Well, why is someone going to bother investigating it if we can't even determine who the victim really is uh, in this case? So as I'm pondering all of these things, a month or so later, Microsoft responds. Uh, and they have this uh, really cool, and, and most companies do actually. So they have an online portal for law enforcement use so you can submit your search warrants and submit subpoenas. Uh, and it's all kind of an automated process. And then they respond through their automated process. And so um, oddly, um, <laughs> the Microsoft portal has issues if you have an existing Outlook account, it can't differentiate. And so they recommend in their documentation that you just make up a fake Microsoft Outlook account in order to get the return for your legal process, which 
is odd to me. Um, it seems like they could figure out maybe a better way and maybe use your law enforcement email like other companies do, but it's Microsoft and, and they do what Microsoft does. But I finally get si signed in with some help with them and I look and the response is, sorry, we have no records. We can't tell you who logged into that IP address, who owned that account. We have no records for that particular time, which, okay, it could happen, but again, I'm a fairly bright guy and I know how computers work and there should be logs of people making connections and there should be logs of who's using an IP address during a certain time. It's not that real shouldn't be that challenging for Microsoft to provide this information, but for whatever reason, they were unable to do that. So challenge number three during an investigation, lack of compliance. So law enforcement relies upon companies, corporations, right, to respond to our subpoenas, to respond to a search warrant, to give that information back so we can continue an investigation. Um, a lot of times companies are not compliant and it's not that they're maliciously not complying. Um, there's a lot of issues with overlapping laws between federal laws and state laws and different states have different laws providing user privacy. So if you're out in California, which Microsoft is um, and some of the other big tech companies, um, Microsoft and that ninth circuit, um, companies have been sued for violating a user's privacy by responding to grand jury subpoenas, by responding to law enforcement search warrants. Um, they've been sued and obviously sued enough to where they're very aware of that. And, and so they almost take the side of the bad guy. And so you send a, uh, you send a subpoena, you send a search warrant, they contact, many times they'll contact the okay. user and say, hey, we have this legal document they want your information is it okay if we give it to them um i'm gonna guess most bad guys probably say mm, no we'd rather you not but um whatever right it's just a, it's just a it's just a challenge um and then there's the lag time so a grand jury subpoena says you have 14 days we need this information microsoft responds within a month or so right and say hey sorry we don't have any records um, I'm still waiting for GoDaddy's response. I still don't know how that domain was registered. Was it used? Um, did they domain kite? Could be. Um, was it a stolen credit card that was used to pay for it? Who knows? At some point, hopefully they'll respond and, and I'll have an answer to that question. So I'm thinking I am sunk in my investigation and that's a little depressing since we're going through this in a class and, and we're teaching it. So, but Good things come to those who wait. So as I'm waiting, we come into the new year, it's 2021, yay, 2020 is over with. And then it, I get a, uh, a report uh, from an individual that their Facebook has been hacked. And the reason that they're con actually contacting Lake law enforcement over this, they're a politician, they're an elected official and their Facebook was hacked and they are dead certain that it is their opponent, right? My opponent, I just know that my opponent has either done it themselves or they've hacked my Facebook and it's all to prevent me, right, from, from being effective because an election is coming up in just a few weeks. Um, and of course I counsel them and say, wait, slow your roll um, and, and share with them a little bit of, I was certain that this was revenge and then weird things are happening with Facebook ads. And so double check your account, make sure you don't have any of those things um, sort of lingering in the background. Uh, they assured me, no, no, that's not an issue. They've never done Facebook ads. Okay, good for you. Um, Facebook provides the IP address that we use to log in. And so I've redacted this one for, well, I'll tell you why in a little bit. Um, so it's a local, not a local, but it's, it's in the United States address uh, based out of California. So this is a California server, California virtual machine. Um, and it's hosted by a cloud provider. So, but a smaller one, this isn't a Microsoft Azure account. This is a smaller company. And so I contact them say, Hey, here's a grand jury subpoena. I need information on this account. And within a day they respond, uh, which is why I redacted their name because I don't want to burn them. They actually did really great compliance. Um, 
all of their login IPs were from Vietnam uh, or Vietnamese internet providers. Um, the address given for the owner of the account and a name was a Vietnam address. The most important thing from my standpoint, the virtual machine that was used to compromise this politician's account, it's still up and running. With a subpoena, I can get account details like these, but I, now I want a copy of that. Um, I want a copy of the virtual machine. I want to see what tools they're running. I want to see uh, what kind of malware they might be, right? I want to see how are they compromising these accounts. I'm pretty sure I understand why, right? They're somehow making money um, using Facebook advertising. Haven't quite figured all that out yet, but they're definitely trying to monetize compromising someone's social media account. So investigation challenge number four for law enforcement. Getting a hold of cloud data requires the help of that provider's IT staff. We can't roll down to a local uh, data center and say, hey, I'm here and I'd like to image one of your servers in this huge array, right? We have no idea where it's physically located. There's just no, it's just not gonna happen. But the data provider, the, the cloud provider has IT staff. They can narrow it down. They could make a, a copy of this, right? They can create a snapshot image or uh, create a, a forensics image. Um, you are reliant upon their good graces, their goodwill um, as to how quickly they might do it or, or uh, whether or not they'll do a, a, a full job for you. Um, in this particular case, they did a great job um, and it was pretty quick. So 57 gigabytes of encrypted data later, um, I now have an image of this virtual server that was used to compromise this politician's Facebook account. So I mount my image, FEK Imager. Uh, I use autopsy, right? So nothing wrong with free, with open source uh, software. When you're conducting investigation, just like you can use open source intelligence, using open source software is just as valid. Um, it's all about our methodology and how we document what we've done. So one of the first things that catches my eye, hey, look, there are 11 different accounts with logins that were created using this machine. 10 of them uh, are Facebook. The 11th is for an app called Zala, which is a Vietnamese anonymizing chat, right? So it allows you to, to send smishing, right? To send text messages um, over or out to uh, phone. So, okay, that's pretty encouraging. Um, lots of information in the web cookies, lots of form autofills, lots of web history in there. Um, so a lot of information on this system and it took several days of looking at it to really go through it. So interesting things, there were only three bookmarks that he had. So this person has a bookmark set up in their browser for Facebook advertising right, for the ad payment inquiry. Hey, I'm having a problem. I have questions about my payment. So um, apparently their payment hit problems happen when you hack someone's Facebook account and you're uh, using, you're, you're billing advertising campaigns to them fraudulently. Apparently it requires a lot of help. So that was pretty interesting. A few user accounts. So as I look through the user accounts on the machine itself, there's really only one. Uh, so there's one active user account, and it's Hua Nam Hua. If I butchered that, if someone has a better grasp uh, of Vietnamese, I apologize for that. So there's one single user who's been using this machine, who's logging into and out of that machine. And I already established that it's from Vietnamese uh, internet providers. So it's actually out of Hanoi uh, is where these the log, all of the logins into this machine are coming from. So other notable artifacts. Um, there were a total of 4,079 email addresses. Most of them were not part of uh, data dumps, were not part of breach dumps. So uh, if you're not familiar with have I been pwned, you can put in an email address, it'll show you all of the associated uh, data breaches that that email has been compromised in or potentially compromised in. The majority of these 4,079 emails were not found in existing dumps. So this was fresh ground. This, he's not relying upon 
uh, credential stuffing, right? This person, I say he, this person is not relying on credential stuffing to try and compromise uh, Facebook accounts. As any good hacking machine, we would expect to see, right? Multiple text files with uh, surnames, with first names, so you can create usernames, um, password um, files with, uh, so the, you know, top 100 and top 10,000. So uh, brute forcing is obviously a potential um, in this person's world. Uh, there were two uh, executables uh, that were on the on the system and not not that had been that's just the best way to say that uh, two uh, known rats right so known malware the 13 kilobytes in size so very small file um, that are used right to fish other users right so they're they're where this person is using this rat malware uh, to fish for credentials uh, assumably right from those 4,079 email addresses. The web cache though has lots of stuff. So I find my victims login information. So my politicians law enforcement, uh, my politicians uh, Facebook login um, is in the web cache. So obviously this is the machine that did it and, and there's the credentials on that. Um, and I also find that there's cache there for credentials uh, for our email address admin at yuenhainam.net. Um, and that was also the email that was listed with the cloud provider as the contact email. So now I know who it is, or I know what machine it is. I think I know who it is, right? I know how they're compromising Facebooks. I know why they're compromising Facebooks. They've managed to monetize, which is something we weren't seeing a lot of previous. Um, and I might even have a, a lead as to who this person is. So of course, pull out the trusty um, web browser um, and I go to the website. And so, hey, look, it's Yuen Hainam and with Google Translate, currently I'm a lecturer and of course I'm Facebook advertising and the CEO of My B, My B Media, a company with five years experience supporting dozens of advertisers we will show you how to use facebook advertising to be successful and i guess it's pretty profitable if you're taking money from clients to run facebook advertising and you're not actually spending that money you're doing it fraudulently so um there was contact information i couldn't resist right so yes i sent him an email uh, and said hey i have i'm putting together a talk um for a conference, um, and I really would love to talk to you beforehand um, about um, hacking social media accounts and this whole Facebook and, and how that happens. Um, not surprisingly, um, they haven't responded to me, which is kind of a bummer. I would thought that would be pretty cool um, to get the hackers right perspective on how much, how how successful are you doing this, and and how much money are you really making. I think that would have been pretty interesting and would love to have put it into the talk, but um, they chose not to respond, but uh, we certainly can, we can follow him on Facebook. Um, so we've had that and I have not done so, but, um, and again, we see the address, right? Same address that was listed in the cloud providers um, account information uh, and it's in Hanoi, uh, Vietnam. So investigation challenge number five, Sometimes we can determine who did it and how they did it and why they did it. Um, but what can we do about someone who's in Vietnam, right? U.S. law enforcement has no jurisdiction outside of the country um, to, to try and arrest or to try and even question someone in a foreign country. You have to involve the State Department and the embassies and all that. And I'm pretty confident our current uh, administration wouldn't get really excited about saying, hey, we'd like to talk to this hacker guy in Hanoi, Vietnam um, about compromising Facebook uh, accounts. So at this point, we're just sort of stuck. And, and even within the United States, um, state law enforcement sometimes will have issues, right? So it's pretty rare that uh, a data breach happens within a single state. 
And so you have this multiple jurisdictions that might claim uh, sort of um, claim control over that investigation, uh, which is typically why we see FBI, DOJ, Secret Service kind of take over uh, when, when something moves beyond state lines because it allows a, a federal entity uh, to conduct uh, or to pursue an investigation um, that hopefully results in an arrest uh, of some sort. So uh, some of the lessons learned. Um, one, uh, if you have not set up two-factor authentication on any important account, really on all of your points, um, shame on you. If, if the company offers two-factor authentication, absolutely it needs to be implemented. Um, this is a way to prevent uh, some of the things that, that can happen inadvertently uh, or, or from myself. Um, conduct an email audit. And so think back, make a list of all of your previous email addresses and see if any of those, right, the, the audit part is how, what, what accounts were they used to log into at any point in the past? Because as mentioned, Facebook never forgets these things. They, they didn't forget credit card data that should have been very outdated um, at that point. Um, but it was still in there and they were still able to um, to try and charge ads against it. There was an old email that was previously previously associated um, with the account. Um, you you would think that um, that would be something that that Facebook might block, but apparently not. Um, and then those connections between the two, right, between Facebook and and PayPal. It's like, hey, how can this still be an active connection when it hasn't been used for, you know, at that time, 10 years um, or so. It's like, uh, okay, this is a problem. Um, if it was a private domain that you had um, your email with, um, take steps to secure it, right? So uh, now I have a list. I have a list of several domains that I will pay for every year, pretty much for the rest of my life, right? I, I don't want to allow them to potentially uh, be used against me for someone to come back and, and try and compromise one of my accounts. Um, lastly, if if you were a victim of uh, any kind of internet fraud, um, please report it. Uh, law enforcement reports it and, and private entities can report it as well. So it's the Internet Crime Complaint Center, the ic3.gov. Um, it's an online form. It's not a whole lot of data but that allows law enforcement to begin to compile um, these trends, right? And we see, is there an emerging trend that um, now hackers from Vietnam are gonna compromise social media um, and then attempt to monetize Facebook advertising? It's certainly a possibility. Um, one I had not seen before, I was completely unaware of it, as were other law enforcement uh, officials that I talked to. Um, about that, right? So this is, well, we haven't seen that before. So is this kind of an emerging trend? Is it, right, it's, it's like ransomware. We we sort of point towards Russia and the Baltic states and uh, banking uh, Trojans. Uh, we we look at South America and Brazil and say, this is sort of that, that type of crime comes a lot from here. Um, maybe social media attacks um, and monetizing Facebook advertising campaigns. Then maybe that's the thing, the crime of choice in Vietnam. Uh, as we collect more data, we'll be able to see, right? we'll know more of that. So uh, with that, uh, we are almost at our 45 minutes. Um, I apologize if I went through quickly. I didn't want to run long. Uh, my contact information, Twitter is, is CyberLeo, so CYB3R underscore Leo, law enforcement officer. Um, Facebook is at C. Thornsburg. I'm on LinkedIn as C. Thornsburg or through the uh, college uh, websites and emails, right? Northeast Lakeview College in, in San Antonio. Um, and with that, um, if anyone has questions, I will be happy to answer them. Okay, Chip. Okay. So in the question and answer section, you can see um, in the chat here, um, 
the first question we have at the top, uh, well, I guess it's more of a statement, isn't it? Uh, amazing presentation, Chip. I have a story to tell you. It can happen to any one of us. Um, this is from <laughs> Darcy Hernandez. Um, well, I, I think that might maybe be best handled uh, over Discord. So if you get into the track two room in the beginning, we can definitely talk through all of that um, after now. But I'll go ahead and move on through the rest of the questions. Um, the second one is, uh, if my email shows up on have I been pwned, what can I do uh, if that's my primary email address, aside from just changing my password? What what things might I go about doing there? Um, so obviously making sure that you you keep your password changed kind of regularly um, and using complex passwords. The most important thing about the have I been pwned is, is not reusing passwords across multiple uh, sites. So credential stuffing is is one of the primary ways that that uh, uh, criminals are, are accessing accounts. So you use the same password on Eventbrite that you used on some other account, and then suddenly, right as they as they go through, once that's hashed out, now they have your password. If it's reused, that's the biggest problem. So when you look through the "Have I been pwned?" is make sure that you didn't use that password. Because even if it says the password hasn't been recovered, don't rely on that, right? So computers get faster and faster and faster um, and, and password hashes are, they're just, they're not gonna, if they are still secure, they won't be secure for very long. So the biggest thing is, is that making sure you're not reusing passwords. Now, there's nothing you can do about it. The data is out there and just make sure you never use that password again. Okay, great. Um, I will go ahead and move on to our next question here. This is from Sage N. Clements. Um, does Texas require peace officers license in order to establish a digital forensics firm? If so, how rigorous is that process? Uh, no, they don't anymore. Um, so um, previously, Texas said you had to be either a law enforcement officer or you had to hold a private investigator's license. Um, that's actually why I have the company Alamo Cyber Security, because back when I started doing network intrusion response, you had to have a private investigator's license to do that. And they've they've eliminated all that. They, they kindly have, have figured out that just because you're a digital forensic person, you don't need to worry about the law enforcement side of it. And you don't need to be registered or licensed by some state entity to prove Right, that you understand the private investigation laws in Texas, which is really what that comes down to. Uh, so no, you don't. And that's a great thing. It, it opens that field up for um, lots of people. We have students that are going through our programs or, or other programs that are majoring in forensics, computer forensics. You no longer have to be a peace officer um, to even work for a law enforcement agency. Uh, in the field of digital forensics. And so to become a peace officer, it's a it's almost a full year of an academy. There's it's not just a, I want to take a study for a test and do that. Texas is is really antiquated in its its law enforcement laws. And so you'd have to go through almost full time for an entire year to become a peace officer. And then if you become a peace officer, unfortunately, no matter what your background is in forensics or or digital stuff, most agencies, they're going to put you out on patrol. So I worked patrol for five years, uh, three of year, three of those years working overnights. And so not a lot happens in San Antonio area. Man, I shouldn't say that. Some cool things, some fun things happen between 10 in the morning or 10 at night and, and six in the morning. Um, but you no longer have to do that to prove your worth um, before you can start doing investigations. So that's a good thing. Okay, um, it looks like we're getting close to time, but I'm going to go ahead and ask one more question live here, and then we can take the rest of the questions um, offline into the, uh, the Discord room. Um, so the last question here is, um, well, first, thank you for the presentation. Um, how do you believe that service providers can get better at preventing this type of abuse? Um, gosh, that's a, that, that really is kind of a challenge. Um, I'm not insensitive to them because it, you know, someone like Microsoft, they have so many accounts that are out there and so many people trying to interact with them. It's, it's tough for them. And they're relying on um, uh, algorithms to prevent fraud. So this particular cloud provider, they ran an algorithm when that account was established based upon the address, based upon what they wanted to do. 
um, based upon the credit card data, and it had a fairly high fraud score. They still opened up an account for that person because the credit card wasn't a stolen credit card. It was legitimately that business. It was legitimately this person's credit card that was used to pay for the service. And so short of monitoring the user's behavior, I don't know how they could do that. And for privacy purposes, we probably don't want um, a cloud provider monitoring all that we do with our virtual machines on their network, right? I, as long as I'm within your, your, uh, your uh, uh, user agreement, then you shouldn't really care exactly what I'm doing. Um, and so I, I don't know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenge. I, I don't know that they could. The, the biggest thing is just being responsive. When they get a subpoena, when they get a search warrant, um, that's legitimate, right? Assisting in the investigation, it, it moves things through quickly. When they resist it, um, it slows things down to a crawl or kills, right? So for my account, I mean, that, that my investigation died because I'm still waiting for GoDaddy, right? And, and maybe it's this same person. I don't know. Um, it could be. It might be someone different. Maybe there's at least two different people that are doing this. So uh, that, that's just a, that's particularly a challenge. And so we're running out of time. So I will jump over into um, Discord um, and uh, see you all there. And, and thank you so much um, for, for spending some time this morning. Uh, and I'll see you guys over in the Discord channel. Hi, my name's Jenny. And I'm here for Operation Safe Escape, an initiative of the 501c3 organization, the Operation Security Professionals Association. If someone you know is affected by domestic violence, you're not alone. We're here to help. We offer tools, information, and resources to help someone safely leave their abusive partner and find a safe place to go. With centuries of security expertise brought together for this specific purpose, our only mission is to get you or your loved one out safely. We do it all for no cost. It's just what we do. Operation Safe Escape focuses on protecting you and your family from the moment you decide to leave up until you are at a safe place. When you want out, we are on your team.